All right, I think everybody's in. Um, and as people come in, uh, before we start, uh, again, for people who just came in, please uh, turn off your mics uh, until the question and answer period uh, at the end of this talk. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to thank you all uh, from Art in Residence. My name is Nathaniel Anchetta. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders here at Art in Residence, and I'm happy to uh, welcome you guys to our What's in a Landscape session two. Um, we have with us today, Deborah Skako and Joel Garcia in conversation. Uh, before we begin, I uh, just wanted to do some Zoom house cleaning rules. Uh, please, again, keep your mics off uh, until the end when there's question and answers. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to write it in the chat and um, we can mention them in the end if you don't want to um, uh, talk out loud um, during the question and answer period. And the last thing is uh, this will be recorded. Uh, if you guys do not want to have your faces shown, uh, you can feel free to keep your camera off. Uh, but if you guys don't mind, um, you can have your cameras on. So with that, um, I will pass it over to Deborah Skako to introduce Howell Garcia. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Nathaniel and, and Moa for, for making this conversation possible. Um, as soon as Nathaniel and I started talking about the idea of a conversation about monuments, I was like, well, clearly we're going to invite Hoel to do this. Like he's the, the first person that I think of always. And I know there was a, a bio on the Eventbrite, so I'm not going to read that. So I'm going to read something that's kind of a little bit more personal because, um, you know, he he knows that I've been a super fan of his for a long time. And I just have a huge amount of respect for the work that he does and the impact that it has on, uh, on certainly on Los Angeles, but I think nationally and internationally as well. Uh, so if you've spent time in Los Angeles, you've likely been touched by Hillel Garcia's work. His collaborative, his collaborative practice as an artist, educator, and organizer in, addresses indigenous sovereignty in public space. His collaborators range from native youth to city and council officials as his work continues to address falsehoods perpetrated by American history books, especially here in Southern California. He is a Monument Lab fellow and right here in Los Angeles was part of a group who successfully removed both the Columbus statue in Grand Park and the Junipero Serra statue near Olvera Street. He has been quietly and persistently working for over two decades to make public space more equitable. Um, as I said, I've been a fan of his for a long time, and I'm now very lucky to call him a friend and a collaborator, and it's a real honor to have him here today. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Joel, who's going to share um, some of his previous projects and about his work, and then we'll have a conversation, and then we'll open it out to Q&A. Over to you, Joel. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you for that, um, and welcome, everybody. Um, I'm here in East LA, unceded Tongva lands, I am the son of Joel and Adama Garcia, the grandson of Carmen Villalobos and Julia and Taurino Garcia. Um, and I say that because the work that I do um, isn't my work alone. It's collaborative. Um, and I'm just, you know, I, I in many ways consider myself the instigator of, of, of some of these things. And figure out how to bring in people um, and you know just try to fig figure out how to bring in everybody into the process. So I do want to um, thank and acknowledge the youth that I work with, um, Kenneth, Georgie, River, um, who've been present during some of these actions, uh, Marina and Gabby, the Tongva and Tatavia elders who also have guided a lot of these processes. So Cindy, Julia, Pamela, Alan, Caroline, and definitely, you know, the partners who have helped um, support this work. Sometimes, you know, with, with um, the one thing we all need to get projects done right money. So the Goethe Institute, Monument Lab, and, and to an extent also, um, you know, being an artist in residence at the LA Clean Tech Incubator, um, it has been a, a wonderful journey of, of, of you know, kind of really centering process-based work as a way that's gonna move us forward in this society. So um, that is what I walk with, that's how I do my work. Uh, and I wanna start off, you know, this presentation by also acknowledging that yesterday was, you know, February 19th and 
you know, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. We're here in LA, so for us, this is something that's that's big because I grew up here in East LA, a community that's also very much heavily um, inhabited by Japanese families. And, and so this impacted East LA, Boyle Heights, Monterey Park, Alhambra, this whole area that we call the San Gabriel Valley. Um, to an extent, this is for me, um, I frame this as the root of Los Angeles. The first mission that was built, um, the San Gabriel mission is like minutes away from my house. And the current uh, mission San Gabriel, um, you know, is up the street, six minute drive. So this is where Ellie began. And, and so I want to honor all of that by also taking into account that this, this place here is so layered with history. And let me go to the next slide. So one of the things that I wanted to touch on around monuments is that they're sacred until they're not sacred. And that they hold power only until folks decide that they don't. And so monuments have been this, this, this tool to, I don't know, imply that somebody has power to do something or somebody that has power over you. And as, and as terrible as it was to see, you know, Capitol Hill, what is em emblematic of democracy in the US be bum rushed by a bunch of white supremacists, it, it also underscores how unpowerful these things actually are and that our perception of it or what we project onto these things is only based on the values that we carry. So for, you know, for all of history, right, man has tried to create things that seem otherworldly. Many times out of um, devotion, mainly out of devotion, um, but also many times, you know, to create empire. And many of these things, we can't explain how they came to be like, this is Teotihuacan in, in Mexico. And, and we know very little about how this was built and who it was built by and, and why they built this. Um, and this is, I believe, um, Tikal down in, in Guatemala. But the things we can't explain and you know, the, the construct of, of colonialism has taught us that if we can't explain them, then you know, aliens did this or somebody else created this, right? And so this is a still from Star Wars. And this is um, Indiana Jones and the you know, King, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. So we can't explain it, aliens did it. And it's usually you know, when it refers to accomplishments by people of color, it's always brushed off as something you know, someone helped us do it. So along the way, you know, we learned from places like Egypt where pharaohs and kings use the idea of statues to hold power. And what happened when a new emperor came or a new pharaoh came into power? They destroyed the previous one and erected their new one. So that's why we see a lot of them with their faces missing. And they fascinated us, right? They, they, Egypt continues to fascinate the world. Um, but we also mimic this, right? This is the Parthenon. Um, we try to mimic these things and as a way to reach the divine. And many times it is these monuments that, that we, we see as accomplishments to, to divinity, right? This is Julius Caesar, um, someone that a lot of heads of state have tried to emulate the US, you know, for sure. And so what happens if we strip that power away or if we take that mystique away? So this is the Citadel in, in just outside of Berlin where many of these statues from the Prussian empire were unearthed um, in the middle of, of Berlin in a garden in one of their parks, like, you know, where you would equate to um, Central Park in New York. So when I walked into this space, about a year ago, you know, with a, with a group of folks from Monument Lab, we all held our breath because they're amazing works of art. They're beautiful and they're just stunning. And the director just kind of very nonchalant said like, oh, you can touch these. And all of a sudden the, you know, like we all sighed and everybody became like a little kid running around the place, you know, touching them. And that power was gone. These, these 
statues, these monuments were created to um, be imposing. You know, they, they're proportionally done to um, give you that, that, that impression because you see them from below, you look up to them. So their hands are larger than they would be proportionally. And so, you know, Lenin, we all who know who Lenin is, but what happens when it's, you know, when all that power is gone, what is left? Who, who, who holds that power? Does it, does it disappear? Or is it something that we as a community, as a society, um, always hold in place? What happens when we, we, we take these, these notions of, of grandeur or accomplishment and say like, you know what, these people didn't do this alone. A society did this, you know? So for me, a lot of the work that I do revolves around that idea of, of bringing, bringing these ideas of power down to, um, to, I don't know, to, to, to people level, right? Flattening these hierarchies of power and figuring out how, how to empower people to you know, shape the world that they live in. Sometimes it can be done with something so you know, fragile as a piece of cloth. You obscure these stories, these false narratives of what a, a city it has accomplished, right? But the city didn't accomplish this, the people did. The people built this. And what happens when you empower youth to envision, you know, a tomorrow that includes them, that is reflective of them? So these things, they only carry power as much as we give them. Um, and, you know, going back to this Columbus statue that was removed, the, city, uh, the county spent an insane amount of resources to keep it in place. And once it came down, once it was once it was appraised, the appraisal was more than was was worth more than the value of, of the statue itself, which was appraised at zero dollars. And so knowing knowing that you know we project so much value onto these things, where do where does that value system come from? Who is it that is teaching us how to do this? And what happens if we invert that and start looking at you know Mother Nature, the land, you know what actually sustains us as being the monuments that we want to nurture, the monuments that we want to grow. Mike? So for me, it's like, what are these monuments of the future? What do they feel like, right? Not what, do they, what, do, not what do they tell us, but what do they feel like? What do they nurture? What do they communicate? And if we look around us, these monuments exist. So this is Vasquez Rocks, just, you know, just south of Lancaster. This is Red Rock Canyon, just north of Lancaster, near to Hatchapi. Did you call me? And yeah. And this is the Toronto Pinnacles. Can you just, look at this? Just, just east of Lancaster, right? These, these are rock How do you that are in our vicinity. Get this set up where you can see the speaker. And so for me, it's like, what, are, what do our future ancestral monuments look like? What from the past can we help bring forward? so that it's inclusive of everybody, so that it's inclusive of everybody's visions. And that's where the work is moving, you know, how we move forward. We don't have, none of us have any answers to what this, this looks like because we've never been here at this place before, but we can create the processes by which we can figure out what this, what, what this can be. And I'll leave you with this Dolly Parton um, note of folks trying to, you know, uh, proposing to, erect a monument for Dolly Parton at, at, you know, on the Capitol grounds and her declining and saying that, you know, given, given the situation that we're in, like maybe that's not the best case scenario. You know, it took a woman to say like, nah, if it was a dude, probably would have been happy to accept the offer, but um, ideas of power, right? Patriarchy. How is it that the majority of public art, civic art is also primarily created by straight white men. And how we, how we as a community, community of artists can help change that. So that's where, that's where my work has been. Um, that's where my work will continue to be. Um, and thank you for, for sitting through this um, presentation. And I look forward to you know, answering some of your questions and diving deep into um, any of your thoughts. Thank you so much. That was 
Amazing. Um, you touched on so, so, so many things there that I, I want to, uh, I want to return to, but, but I think just, just like to start at the very beginning, this idea of, of the monument as a way to create empire, I think is so important, especially in this moment, right? Where like, we're seeing, we're seeing a, a system that people assume to be sort of safe and stable being completely ruptured. And so I wonder like when you speak about, about the creation of empire now as we're seeing the kind of downfall of a modern empire in a way, um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how that relates to the removal of statues and how that relates to, to the, the actions that have been taken in order to um, address what needs to happen because it's not happening on its own, right? So if you could speak a little bit to that, that would be great. Absolutely. And the Columbus statue and the Sarah statue, those removals went through two very different processes. The county owned one, um, the Columbus one that was gifted to the county. So there's some similarities. The county assumed that this was a work of art, that this was valuable, that at the end of the day, the artist had more power than the community. And so we, my question was like, well then who is giving this object power? The county is. And that's where the tension became. How do we, how do we reanalyze what power is, what value is? Um, and it wasn't until a community of, of, of folks went into a arts commission meeting to tell our stories, to share how this has impacted people, did they respond and were like, okay, we need to remove this. It took the story of a young boy being ashamed of his braid, hiding under his desk in kindergarten and cutting his braid off to feel um, like he could sit with his with his classmates and not be ashamed of who he was, who he was because of these stories of Columbus. It wasn't until they heard that story that they decided like, okay, we need to remove this. Um, and so we pushed the county to, to take ownership over a decision that they had made of, of keeping it up and they took it down every step of the way. You know, we held them accountable to that. The Sarah statue, again, you know, gifted to the city um, the Department of Cultural Affairs, I believe, owns that statue. The pedestal that it sat on, because the city council paid for it, so the city owns it, and Parks and Recs operates the land that the pedestal was on. So three different jurisdictions, and anytime anybody tried to, you know, address this issue, it was always like passed from one jurisdiction to the other. And so there's, you know, there's records of 30 years back, people trying to get this, you know, get this thing down. Um, and as an artist, as an activist, as an organizer, you also have to recognize like the goal moments, all right? This is when it feels right. And during this past summer, it just felt right. Like this is, this is what needs to happen. This is an opportunity to, to make this happen. Um, and because it was a moment of community taking, you know, um, taking agency with how they feel their city should be responding to things, um, we took it down. And it, you know, the, the irony in, in, in that is too that in that park across from Union Station, right, this beautiful building, um, there's unsheltered folks living there. This was done in the, in, you know, in the middle of summer. Um, once that statue came down, it sat on the floor for about three days. Nobody came to pick it up. So what was the value, right? Um, once they did pick it up, they put it in a climate controlled warehouse and it's, and it's been sitting there in, in air conditioning all this time while unsheltered folks have, have to brave not only the weather during the summer, but also have to brave COVID. So the, you know, just, you know, that, that just underscores sometimes the priorities within our city and, and, and as a society as to like what we value. And sometimes we don't value human life, but we value these things that make us feel like there's some stability in, in, in our society. Thank you. Um, there's one thing that, that you just said that really struck me was about how it, it was the story of that little boy that actually 
pushed them to act to to respond and to um to actually take the statue down right and and i know that that was a very official process i know that was a very long process but the, the thing that's so interesting and, and i think this applies not only to monuments but i think this just applies to the state of our world especially at this incredibly bifurcated moment is that we don't connect with personal stories right and one thing i think about a lot and that that i really see in in your work is like how do we as artists use those per personal stories as a vehicle to readjust the balance of power and and i think that's such a difficult conversation in in monuments only because it's like it's it's in our in our minds historically it's a fixed thing so what is it that you represent? What is it that you place? And, and again, I think monuments are about like empire, legacy, patriarchy, all of these things that are so embedded in our culture. So how, how do you uh, initiate bringing stories to monuments in a way that allows for greater empathy and connection and does kind of the opposite of historically we've been really good at doing? You know, that moment with the, you know, um, arts commissioners for the LA County, we all walked away kind of like with with some heaviness. And, you know, and, and unfortunately, when it, you know, that's that that heaviness, what it wasn't for us to walk away with, but we did. So I learned from that, like, it shouldn't be us that this that this weighs on. And in that moment too, like we 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 also kind of reinforced their power to make a decision that we should have made from the get go. With the Sarah statue, like for artists to to be able to do this type of work and be able to um, you know to to really push for change. For me, it comes from from a very core value of care. At the end of the day, removing these monuments isn't to hurt anybody, but to create an opportunity to heal. When we removed the Sarah statue, it was important that there was witnesses, that there was folks who were, um, you know, and I say witness rather than spectator because there's, a, there's power in being a witness to something. Um, but that there was also, you know, folks who contributed to this 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 action of of ceremony and healing. Um, and so, as an artist, as someone who has, you know, kind of um, programmed music festivals and and art exhibitions, I I approached I approached that day from the you know with the same um, with the same intention. How is every person that is gonna that is gonna be in attendance? What is their role? You know, a lot of this goes back to ceremonial frameworks. Um, everybody has a role to play, from the person who builds an altar, from the you know from the individuals feeding folks you know present there, um, from the singers, from drummers. There's a role that everyone plays. And usually, for artists, we get you know take creative placemaking for example. Artists are put at the center of it, and even with a with a with a framework of creative placemaking, where like it's supposed to be about the community, the artist is always at the center and is always mostly always making decisions. So how do we dismantle that, and how do we empower people? So I take a lot from Zapatismo this idea that at one point it is my turn to lead, and at another point it's somebody else's turn to lead, and my job to support them this idea of circular leadership. So on that day, you know, um, some folks received a text of like, you know, you're invited to a ceremony at this time, at this place. No questions asked, they showed up because they knew that this was, their, you know, that they were gonna contribute to something. While there, you know, um, as an artist, you kind of choreograph the energy around the space and that's all you do. Um, and you know what? What was seen across across the world, and it feels funny saying that, was literally twenty seconds of of the tugging and pulling and the statue coming down. But we were there for about two hours, 
And it was those stories that were shared amongst each other, right? That, that really created that, that thread, that interwoven experience that once we left that place, we were all um, invested in a better Los Angeles. We were all invested in a better sense of community, but we're also from that point forward, we're also accountable to that change. So we witnessed something, so we're also accountable to that change. And, and that's how you, you know, for me, that is how you empower people by giving them, you know, full, like, you know, a full system of support to then come to the, you know, come and build that table that we sit around and say like, okay, this is what it, we, we envision our city to become. And that's, you know, that's the work. And that's what we're still trying to do is build that table that we can all sit around and be like, all right, let's get to work. But we got to know each other first, right? Beautifully said. Um, there's a couple of things in there that that I'd like to I'd like to return to because I think that that process is so important to addressing this imbalance of power um, and also to kind of correcting many of the falsehoods of American history, right? And and it's interesting that parallel of the Columbus statue and the Sarah statue and like who who held the power in each of those moments and how that felt. Um, one thing I, I'd love to talk a little bit about, because I know since the Sarah statue came down, that site has continued to be used. And so one thing I think about a lot is the, the impermanence of these moments and, and this transition, this kind of reckoning that we're in at the moment, finally, um, and how these spaces are transitioning and, and eventually will become something else that's more permanent, right? And so this is also related to the question of, of history and documentation and archiving and all of these kinds of things. Um, there's sort of two questions in this, right? One is, is uh, in the removing of monuments, the counter argument to that is you're erasing history. My response to that is actually history is being made. So, you know, it's like there's kind of two ways to look at it because you, you have one camp that's saying, well, if we just take it down, we'll forget about it. And, and it's like, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen. But also, you know, right now, this is history. Like the, the Black Lives Matter protests over the summer were, you know, the largest civil rights movement in, in American history. I, I believe, right? So I think I, I'm interested in your thoughts on how we even as we're moving through it, how do we acknowledge that um, whatever it is that comes next in a more permanent sense was made, as you say, by the people. It wasn't by people in power, it was people on the ground doing this work. So I wonder with all of your experience, if there's any, any like processes that you're considering or conversations that you're having around how to ensure that this history remains, because I think it's really vital going forward for future generations to know that this is how it happened and that we, we have to keep that power to make sure that things stay in line. Yeah, I do this work with the idea that I leave a template and somebody else can adapt that to their, to their community. With the Sarah statue, we notified um, public officials that this was happening. We notified other stakeholders that this was happening, but we did it in a way that allowed them to respond to the well-being of people rather than their own instinct of this is my job to not allow any vandalism to happen, for example. And even within that, right, <laughs> we, we knew that the Columbus statue was worth zero dollars. It was a copy of a copy. The Sarah statue was exactly the same type of profile of object. It was a copy of a copy. So we banked that it wasn't worth anything. So that, that was also prefaced. Like, there's precedent to these things. They're not worth anything. They're only worth the trouble that anybody wants to put somebody through like jail or whatever. That's, that's the trouble that it's worth. Um, and so it, it, I'm, I'm also a big believer in open sourcing things. So this was done, you know, fully transparent um, because that's the only way that like somebody else can really take ownership over these processes. Um, what that did and what that showed the city, for example, was that our intention was not to damage anything. 
our intention was not to make Sarah or or the church um, to be, you know, to be the bad guys in this scenario, or that we create this binary of good and evil. They learned that we were doing something that needed to be done so that folks who live in LA can feel good about like the stories that we tell about LA. Since then, there's been multiple conversations, some with the city and some with, I, I, would, I would guess, I would say historians and, and folks connected to the church. On one end, um, there's an opportunity to finally at Olvera have some sort of programming and maybe a, a building that reflects at least First Peoples. And it's a shame that in, in, you know, in all this time in downtown LA, there really isn't any, anything that would say that prior to Los Angeles, the Tongva, the Batavian community had, you know, that their ancestors were here. There's a plaque at Olvera on the floor, you know, something that people walk over on a daily basis without noticing. But in LA, there isn't anything that says like, there was a community here before this. So that's, that's something that happened that is ongoing, that is possible by removing a, a monument. On the other end, when it comes to the church, I think there's there's uh, there's starting to be a better understanding of, of what it is to to look at somebody like Sarah and understand that what they did was create a brand around this person, and that this brand has, you know, on both ends of the coin, become a catch-all for the good stuff that they say he did, but then all the bad stuff that we know that happened. And although he was not the the sole driver of of a lot of these things. You know the church created a brand and it, it, it became a recipient of that and and seeing it from that perspective one of the interesting things that happened in one of these conversations was with Stephen Hackle who teaches at um, UCR over in Riverside who's written many books on on Sarah and has defended him really you know has defended him and defended him and his legacy and it was and it was interesting that he's the one who said like, well, if we look at it from that perspective, right, it's historically inaccurate for a statue of Sarah to be at Olvera because he had very little to do with the establishment of that community and in regards to the city of Los Angeles. So um, historically inaccurate. And there's a lot of things that are historically inaccurate. A statue of Columbus at Grand Park what 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 is the significance of that other than somebody trying to wield power and say like well we want it here and this is where it's going to be no due process no due process for any of them it was gifted it was placed there and no nobody the community didn't have a say so you know in a lot of that it is just creating space by removing something to then build understanding and acceptance Sometimes we won't accept, you know, we won't understand everything that somebody experienced or their family went through. Like I could never, I will never understand what California Indians experienced, but I can accept the fact that there's a lot of trauma that was caused to them by the development of this city. And I think it's just that, like learning to accept things that we don't understand um, and move forward from that. That's great. Um, one one other aspect of the uh, of the the Sarah monument that I'd love to talk about is the the kind of ongoing use of the pedestals in the space. And I think we touched on this a little bit before, but I wonder if you could just share a little bit more about some of the ceremonies that you've had there and how how that space continues to be honored as a space of power now. Definitely. So I'll back up to the removal. It was removed um, during the summer solstice, June 20th. So that already kind of, you know, the idea of doing things in, in a time frame that isn't, um, you know, a Western time frame is important. How can we infuse our creative practice with our indigenous practices? So it was removed on the, you know, on the summer solstice. On the fall equinox, um, a ceremony was held there again as a way to continue to hold space. 
and change the energy of that that park and how it's been used and create new uses for it. The security team that was there during the removal um, who saw this as vandalism, when we went back during the fall equinox, they're the ones who opened the gate for us to be able to do this. You know, the, the El Pueblo management team supported what we're doing, you know, so they coordinated it for us to be able to be there. And the security guards are the ones who opened it for us. So we, you know, the place got um, embellished with black, red, white, yellow ribbons and people's prayers. We went back two weeks later, I believe, to remove them. Um, and the security guards, the same security guards, didn't want us to remove them. They're like, you've made this ugly, great thing that's been here for years look beautiful by adding color to it. And we just want you to keep these ribbons here. But we couldn't, you know, we didn't want to, you know, create any fire hazards or anything. But in that alone, just the way even the security guards related to space was changed. And that's important. Because then what are they there for? Are they there, are security guards there to, um, you know, protect property? Or are security guards there to care for us? So even like, I really like to push at that, that, that notion of safety um, as always being policing and looking at wellness and care as what the role of, of you know, for lack of a better term to connect it, like, you know, the infrastructure of police, like that needs to change. So that is very much at the core of, of like why we do things in this very open, transparent communal way so that even the security guards there change their behavior towards these things. And, and that was just kind of great to walk away from there. Like, look, we built allies with these, with these folks. Moving forward, they're not gonna see us as threats. They're not gonna see folks like us as threats, but they're gonna see us bringing and contributing to the space that they help, uh, you know, kind of steward as their job. Um, so it's those tiny shifts that then create bigger ripples. I would say that's a huge shift. I mean, I think I think that's so interesting because it's also about um, it's like the danger of the single story, right? So so especially at that time, any um, there was so much fear around protests. There was fear around rioting. There was fear around the way that actions were depicted, as opposed to the the majority peaceful actions that were actually happening at the time. And so to see that power shift from, or I'm sorry, that perception shift from people where it's like you could potentially pose a threat to them because they might have to exude force on you to, to, to keep everybody quote unquote safe, right? Mm -hmm. Versus actually you, you are doing something that's also not only just for you, but actually is in honor of the space and the entire community, past, present, and future, that inhabits that space, yeah. and I think that's really important. At the a week after the Sarah statue was removed, there was also a ceremonial action at the San Fernando statue, and this is the one with the little where he's walking with the little boy, the one that is like probably one of the most disturbing ones. Um, when we arrived there, there was already a gentleman standing in front of the statue, protecting it. He was praying and nobody wanted to go talk to him. Down the street, there was maybe about 10 to 15 police cars just waiting. So I went to approach him and, and, and kind of explain to him that all that was gonna happen that day was that a group of youth who felt very strong about taking a specific action that all they were going to do was wrap the statue in, in, in black plastic and obscure it so that they're removing it for that moment symbolically from you know public view. And he made me promise him that no damage would come to the statue. And I said, I promise nothing's going to happen. We're here to ensure that the youth can do what they're going to do um, and that they are able to, you know, to do their act of protest. And he's all like, well, I support the constitution, so I'll support you. And he became the one person that when any, 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 anyone in opposition showed up that day, he would go and talk to them and talk them down. 
Wow. You know, that was very like, that was beautiful to see and very powerful. Like he disagreed with our perspective to this, but he supported our, 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 our right to protest this as well. And they got testy for a while, people yelling, people shouting. There was this one man who hit somebody, um, but he was the one there to talk them down. You know, devout Catholic person, devout to Sarah, but he respected that, you know, that there, there could be a chance that maybe some of the stuff that was being shared with him about the abuse of, of California Indians might actually be true. And for me, you know, those, you know, I would say that he's going to carry that with him for the rest of his life. And he's going to change the perspective of other Catholics who might see this as like a very black and white conversation of like Sarah's a saint and say like, well, maybe there's, there's some things that we need to reconsider. And if we can reconsider these things for the sake of humanity and for the sake of the well-being of everybody, then maybe, maybe that's where we have these bigger conversations. It's so incredible because I think, especially when you're talking about something as as uh, powerful and internationally recognized as monuments, there's a perception that that change can only happen from the top down, right? Because it's like, oh, well, governments are never going to take them down, and but but I think that's just you've you've given us several examples of how it, it's just it's conversations. It is literally one person at a time. It's connecting with people and, and creating empathy for experience that's different to your own, where we can actually have a wider spread acceptance of this. Um, that's a really, really powerful story. And there's a question about like, you know, you know, you know, to to being a witness to these things. When we, you know, the story about us going to the Arts Commission meeting and hidden from public view, having this conversation, right? If I had never shared it with anybody, nobody would ever know. They're obviously they're not gonna share with folks. You know, it's not even in their minutes. Um, it just says like, you know, um, presentation by native community in their minutes, that's all it says. And when, when you're a witness to these things, whether you're on either side of, of like the conversation, you become accountable to it. And like for like for example, this this gentleman is forever gonna be able to say like, you know what, these these folks who came and organized and did this, they're not bad people. You know, they're just like us. They carry a certain perspective, but they're just you know they're they're. They have every right to share that perspective. You know, being a witness to these things is also holding yourself accountable, but holding that moment accountable to the truth. So that person was there. And if the media tried to misrepresent what actually happened, you better believe that that person's gonna feel empowered, whether he agrees with what happened or not, to tell the truth and be like, that's not what happened. This is what actually happened. So as artists, how we create more of those moments so that people who experience our art, our creativity can carry that message forward is, is I think the, the work, you know? I, I, I love that that's where, um, you know, you pause and be like, okay, well, I'm gonna present this work, but how, how can this carry, how can this transcend beyond this room? That's, that's awesome. And I think, I don't know, I'm assuming that you saw the question in the comments and that's why you so beautifully addressed it. But I think, so there, there was a question, what do you mean when you say there is power in being a witness? Can you give us an example? So I think you just really beautifully answered that. Um, and, you know, I would also say like, I was, I was there on the day that the Sarah statue came down and, and it was so incredibly powerful and, and, um, I would support it and advocate it, advocate for it regardless. But the fact that I was there means, mean I, I, it's, it's as you say, like I feel accountable to that space. I feel accountable to supporting everything that happens in that space, and to really, also just, just um, as much as I can as a person who's in my skin, 
understanding the power of that and, and bearing witness to the power of that to the people it affects the most was extraordinary. And, and the truth is it made everything feel, feel possible because yeah. it was like this was done so um, respectfully and peacefully and, and beautifully and in community with one another. And that's, that's the way that one by one these things fall, right? And the trust that, that was even built between us and I guess the city for the police to be called away and be like, don't show up, let them do their thing. I think that speaks volumes to, to the care that we, that we put into doing these actions. Um, and you know, um, there's a question around like what, what happens after these, these monuments are removed. At Grand Park, um, the county the county actually put up some money to do some programming around, um, you know, other narratives around the city of LA um, or contesting the narrative of Columbus. Two projects came out of it. One was a art installation by a Tongva artist, Mercedes Dorame. And another was a virtual storytelling project by Cindy Elvitri, a, a Tongva elder, which took form in a, um, in two ways, a book that she put out, but also a virtual reality experience. And we hope like, you know, for me, these things aren't necessarily just about the statue because then we're giving it more value than it is. But just this year, LA County um, approved $4.8 million in funding <coughs> for nonprofits and in, in, for arts nonprofits. $65,000 of that 4.8 million went to two organizations um, that, that do work or that provide arts programming for indigenous communities. One of those entities does it part-time. So not even the full $65,000 is being allocated to native, like programming for native folks. That's a huge inequity. Removing the Columbus statue is, is is an opportunity to be able to have that conversation as well and push for equity around arts funding. With the Sarah statue, um, like I mentioned, part of it is to have equi equitable representation out of Veda for at least first peoples. But because of that as well, there's an opportunity to be able to even reclaim some of that land and give it back to the Tongva community so that they can have agency to, to decide what they do with it. Um, there's also positions at the El Pueblo Monument, which is the organizational structure within the city that operates that area of, of Olvera, that has vacant positions like the historical curator position that's part of their charter. So they're mandated to have these positions filled and they're not. So th these are also ways to fill those positions, potentially with young artists, young native artists to develop um, you know, their career as a curator. Um, and to program something that is reflective of their community. So even though it is a, you know, the monument has been the, the, the excuse to then create larger conversations around inequities in the city, um, we knew that from the beginning and, you know, there's a lot more work to do. There's a lot more work around this. That is but more than a monument. Absolutely. Well, and I think that's it, right? Because ultimately, it's it, it's a. I think a part of of this shift that we're seeing happening is an acknowledgement that everything is interconnected. So a monument is not just a monument. A monument is tied to a false history. It's tied to oppression. It's tied to patriarchy. It's tied to power. It's tied to all of these things. So as those things start to fall away in a very public way, then it softens, right? And we will have counter protests at, you know, I mean, you started with the insurrection, right? Like there are going to be people who feel threatened by that, but sorry. I mean, yeah. I don't know and, you know, the, the interesting that. thing that happened too is like a week after the Sarah statue was removed, the city council put forth a motion. Within that motion, they declared it a, an act of civil disobedience because there didn't exist a process within the city to DSS harmful artworks, harmful monuments. And so now there is, now there is a, like, you know, a, a start of a process to be able to account for some of these things that, that exist in our city.
It's so awesome. So, you know, we, we won't have to pull down the monument again in order to do that. There's a process now that we can, that we can hold the city accountable to. That's great. Um, and I know Charlie Engelman has a question that they would like to ask. So I'm just gonna ask you to unmute. Uh, there you are. Hi, um, thank you both so much. This has been really great. Um, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so my question is related to what we're, we're just talking about um, and accountability. And I'm curious, you know, if we kind of rely on these visual markers and there's, um, I think a lot of people have, you know, more recently become aware of the kind of agenda behind a lot of these monuments. Um, and I'm wondering with this removal, which I think is so important, um, you know, removing these monuments, are, are we also removing a kind of accountability for what they were, for their, the kind of agenda that they had and this, this, this um, act of, of kind of supremacy and suppression and, you know, what, what happens when we, you know, are a couple of years from now and the statue, statue toppling is kind of buried in our Instagram feeds and in the news feeds and, you know, how, how important is it to, to kind of hold on to an accountability for, for who put these statues there, what they stood for and, and the kind of uh, agenda that they had. Um, and, and I'm thinking, you know, kind of about how maybe we need a, 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 certain, a certain type of violence in order to heal and, and kind of what happens when we don't, we don't have visual markers of that violence anymore. Um, that being said, of, of course, I, I, I want these places to be populated, these sites to be populated with, um, with uh, you know, uh, something much better, you know, I guess for, uh, yeah. I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so I'll go back to, <laughs> to folks to, I laugh because while in Germany, um, in Berlin, you know, having conversations around this, they kind of laughed at, 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 at us Americans. You, know, you, 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 you guys take these statues that are metal that sat outside and then you put them in wooden boxes to protect them. You know, it's like, it's wood, like metal stronger. Like, <laughs> what are you protecting them from, you know? Um, but they also say like, you know, if you, if, you, if you really walk around places like Berlin, you don't see really much of any monuments to, you know, to the Nazis, to Hitler, primarily because they kind of cannibalized their own, um, they kind cannibal of cannibalized themselves, you know, they were, they were melting down statues in order to make bullets and tanks and stuff like that. Um, which again goes back to like the, the actual importance of these are not, they're not really important. If they were important enough, then do you melt them to make more bullets? Probably not. Um, but for them, they don't really need visual cues to remember like the atrocities that, that happened there. Um, I think they've done a lot of work around educating younger folks about this. There, there, there's a sense of, I think, ownership to, you know, and I saw this firsthand, like if you stop somebody in Berlin to ask them a question about like the Nazis or about um, what happened, um, the Berlin Wall, they might be upset because you're like, you're bothering them or whatever, like these damn Americans asking so many questions, but they'll stand there and tell you like their perspective, you know? There, they, there's a sense of ownership around righting the wrong. And I think when, when we, when one of the things that happens is that we disassociate our own culpability in some of this and then rely on these visual markers to, to hold to that, you know? So when I say like, you know, and I say this a lot, is like, I, I'm an uninvited guest here in Los Angeles. This is not my ancestral homeland. Living here in Los Angeles, 
is an unintended barrier for the Tongva community to ever have their land back and for them to have full agency over their ancestral home. That is something that I have to like reconcile with on a daily basis and I do my work understanding that I think as a society, when we feel ownership around the atrocities that were committed on behalf of the US to have what we have today, that type of healing, that type of reconciliation is what needs to happen in order for us to have like a you know, much healthier society. Um, but we're not there yet, you know? We're, we're working towards that. I think we're holding space for that. Um, there's a lot to learn from from folks in, in Germany around this type of work. Um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunities to learn from folks here in, in, in Los Angeles around this idea of like restorative justice, transformative justice. You know, how, how do we move, remove the the um, the the I don't know how how would you say it, the 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 culpability of the person from the culpability of the system. Like that's something that we have to like untangle and be like, okay, people do stuff because they were conditioned to do these things. And it's a system that is at fault, not the people itself. You know, when folks say defund the police, it isn't about, it's about removing punitive measures to mistakes that people make. And, you know, bringing in a system of care and support to those missteps that we make as humans. And that's all it is, you know, shifting that perspective from, from a, a perpetrator to somebody who needs help, somebody who needs, um, you know, systems of support. Thank you. Um, with that, I have kind of a big question. <laughs> As if, they, as if all of these aren't big questions, but it's something that you and I have talked about a lot, which is, which is power, right? Which is really what we're talking about with the removal of the monuments, but also with the initiation of a monument, right? And, and I think now what we're starting to see is the balance of power has shifted in, in many, many, many different ways. Um, and I remember reading something, you know, this was a few years ago when it was kind of looking to this election and what's going to happen and you know concerns and all sorts of things and and it was saying you know power is only achieved when power is given so in order for someone to have power everybody has to agree that that person has power by abiding to those rules and i think that's really important to remember because it can feel overwhelming as an individual to think how can I have any power in, in this collective when I'm like a grain of sand on a beach, right? So it's like, but all the grains of sand are what make the beach. So it's kind of thinking about it in those terms. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on, on the next phase of the power in, uh, in commissioning new monuments, right? So I think we're in this incredible transitionary period where there's there's a reckoning, there's um, an, an addressing of all sorts of things, imbalances of power. Um, but so how do we how do we harness this into something that can move us forward in a way that that is I don't want to use the word permanent because I don't think anything is permanent, but that's uh, less transitional, I guess I would say. Oh my. <laughs> Did that um, question even make sense? It does. Okay. <laughs> and so just, just from an arts perspective, right? What, mm -hmm. what happens if we all collectively decide not to apply for funding from a specific foundation and say, you know what, we're not gonna apply. We don't, we don't, like, we don't like this application. It feels shitty. It, this is nonsense. And we know some of these applications are just nonsense. What would that foundation do? They'd freak out. They'd be like, nobody applied for, for our grant. Um, it, you know, part of, part of that muscle that foundations flex is everybody wants my grant, you know? Like we get 400 applications and we only give out 80. You know, would things change in that foundation? 
on the spot. With COVID, how many of us have always tried to get reimbursed back from some of these grants and it takes months and up to a year? Like the NEA, for example, is, is just horrible. Um, but in that moment of pressure, all of a sudden, these big foundations were willing to do like Venmo payments. So when the pressure is there, things can change. So as artists, we can change funding cycles. We can change um, funding applications. We, we can change the system. It just takes will. It just takes organizing. But it also takes being uncomfortable. Being uncomfortable and being being a feeling being, being willing to sit with that discomfort of like, well, we don't know if this is actually going to happen, but we have to give it a shot. We don't know if we're going to get the result that we want, but we have to give it a shot. Because I'll tell you, when foundations or or even you know state applications, when they're not getting the numbers that they that they hope they get, they start freaking out. And they start reaching out like, hey, can you have your folks apply to this? Be like, no, why? <laughs> why? And they're not applying for a reason. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I mean, there there is power in collectivity. And I think this is a moment where, you, you know, these systems that have been, you know, imposed on us, all these systems right now are, are they're vulnerable, they can change, they can change. You know, the fact that the county is also, um, you know, one of notorious for the amount of paperwork that you have to go through in order to get reimbursed for any, like, you know, for anything, right? The other day I got an email from USC for, for payment that is like a 37 manual just to get an honorarium, right? 37 page manual. Um, But the fact that we're at a point where Venmo payments are optional, Cash App, PayPal, that shift is there. You know, we just got the momentum is there. We just got to keep pushing. We just really got to keep pushing. Great. I see a question uh, from Larissa Nichols saying, can you talk more about the concept of circular leadership and power? Uh, yeah, and this is, I, I mean, th this isn't something that happens on the spot. It's, it's definitely practice. It's definitely um, something you have to try and try and over again, because for many of us, right, how many times have we walked into a room, sat in a meeting, had, have said something, and then, then it gets shut down, especially if you're not a straight white man. And we all know the notion of like mansplaining. You know, as women, you say something in a meeting, no response. This dude says the exact same thing. Great idea. So we walk with some of that trauma of like not wanting to give our opinion, not wanting to give, you know, our input into something. And when you finally have that opportunity, it's like you need some support in order to develop that muscle to then be like, yeah, here's my vision. Let's let's make this happen. So the Zapatistas, and this is, they're not the only ones. They're, this is, you know, this is something that folks across the world have been doing. Um, look at, you know, they look at their whole community. Okay, who is who is the educator? Who is the arts person? Who is this? Who is that? You know, and they remove that part of that you know, attachment of like this one person doing this one thing with, in order for us to have a healthy society, we all need to know a little bit about how everything works. Doesn't mean that we got to do it all the time. Doesn't mean that we are responsible for it all the time. But if I had an arts organization where everybody knew how to put a budget together, everybody knew how to write a grant, everybody knew what it what it actually took like to program out in community and you know down the board like every every single one of these roles like everybody kind of knew how they function how efficient will we be as an organization we'd be very damn efficient and that's the zapatistas right they everybody knows about farming 
everybody knows about not necessarily capitalism, but commerce. In order to, you know, to get this into our community, we grow coffee, we sell it, and, you know, we're able to buy this or trade this. You know, they, they grow coffee down in Chiapas and they trade it for, you know, a specific type of corn down here in, in Arizona. And it's in there, right? Like, you know, a lot of times executive directors don't know what it means to be a, a program manager. And they freak out the moment that they have to be in community and, and on the spot figure out a solution to something that's going on. But if everybody had a hand in, in programming and budgeting and grant writing, when it comes to like providing a service for a community, you'd be providing like a damn good service because it'd be efficient. The intention would be centered on people receiving that service in the best possible way, rather than the finance person being like, you spent too much money on paint. So it's in building that muscle of like, everybody takes an opportunity to lead at any given point and we support that person. Next week, somebody else, the following week, another person. And, and that's how you build leadership, right? Like how many, how many organizations have their founders or their EDs who are there for 20 years leave and then everybody freaks the F out, how we're gonna make this happen. You know, for me, that goes along the way to a succession planning. You know, if you plan, like, I'm only gonna be here for five years and then we get somebody else ready, you're in a much better place as, as, as an arts organization, much better place like as a community. If everybody took, you know, a turn at leading. I hope that answered the question. That's great. Thank you. Um, and it's funny. I mean, it's just, it's, it's so, uh, it makes so much sense. And it's also counter to what, what kind of, I would say America, but I would say in general, like capitalism deems success, right? Because what, like, what is deemed as success is like, you have power, you have money, you have, and this is, this is like, you know, kind of American ideology that I'm, I'm referring to, not every person in America, obviously, but it's this idea that, um, that, you know, it's this like, I alone can fix this, right? Which is just not true of anything, anywhere, anytime, because everything is connected and no one person has all the skills to fix everything, right? So, um, and it also, it also kind of, it's just, it, it's about interdependence as well, right? It's about this idea that like, we all have sets of skills that when we put them together, make us more successful as a society. Yeah. It's really beautiful. Um, okay. I think we are at almost 3.15. So I think, uh, do, are there any more questions or? Any any comments before we close? Hey, Joel, it's it's Nathaniel. Uh, I wanted to thank you guys. Uh, amazing talk. Um, but I, I do have one question, and the question is about follow through. So, like after an event of taking down a monument, right, and it's a powerful one, and it gets documented, and this goes along with what Charlie was saying about accountability, is that when that event happens and is documented and is now in its place in history, how does it continue to have effect and play a role um, in, in the kind of change that it initiated? Um, like what happens to the monument, like to, to, to the monument, which now serves as a, a space of expression? Um, and how does the documentation kind of continue to, to move forward um, uh, and almost become instrumentalized? The follow through, I would say, is the most important part of it. You know, there were some, there's a couple monuments that were removed. One in particular ended up in, um, in a golf course in Texas. I think it was a Columbus one. Some dude bought it, the city deassessed it, put it up for sale, um, wasn't, you know, wasn't keeping tabs of like who was buying it, but it ended up in Texas on the golf course. So for us, it, it is important to track and follow through till the end. 
the Columbus statue sits in a warehouse at the moment. Um, the county deassessed it, and we're we're part of every single step of the process. The Sarah statue at the moment also sits in a warehouse. Both of them, the one from San Fernando and the one from Olvera, those two will also be deassessed. Who who and how or where they end up, you know, that we're responsible to that. I feel personally responsible to ensure that they don't end up in some other public space, um, you know, privately owned by somebody. Um, because then, uh, you know, then, we'll, you know, what was all this for, you know? So I think the follow through is just as important, if, if not more important than the removal of the statue itself. Um, it'd, be, it'd be a mistake of me to also center that work on, on just my work alone um, so it is gonna. It, it is slow moving um, to ensure that the most, you know, the most amount of folks can have a say in this process, um, which is why some of these spaces will sit empty for a while until collectively, where I think we're all like in a good place to say like, okay, this is what comes next, and it's and that's okay. Like, we don't need to replace a statue with another statue. We can shift that energy of that space and and create a whole new use for 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 it. Period. And if that's what it is, then that's what it is. Thanks, Joel. I appreciate that. Um, I, I have one follow up on that. Is that when those so seeing as those there's no immediacy to replace those statues, um, you know, is that space going to just indefinitely stay that way? Like, or is a city sort of intended or or like required to have to put something back there like who kind of controls that space now because it feels like it's almost now just like in this weird flux yeah um a group of youth from the um, indigenous international youth council which started out of standing rock they've been using that park for regular meetings and 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 art making so they they don't need to ask me permission they don't need to ask permission from you know from el pueblo monument um they are just not doing it. And it's part of the, you know, kind of part of the culture now at Olvera that youth are gonna use this place. Um, so I think a lot of it is just gonna happen organically. The city knows that these are issues that they also need to figure out. So that task force for civic memory and monuments is trying to come up with like best practices around how to make decisions. Um, and that's just one approach, right? Like, I think we, we don't have the answers to any of this. Um, and, and acknowledging that we don't have the answers, I think is the best way to move forward. It's like, we got to figure it out together. And I'm glad that the city and the county have kind of are at that point of like, we don't know how to move forward. So we're just going to take it slow. I appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Um, so with that, well, is there anything else that you would like to share before we close or? Um, I mean, just super, super thankful for the invitation and for seeing, you know, some good folks like Isabel. Um, you know, it's, it's always good to have these conversations and, you know, talk about like the back end of things. As artists, we, we like to, you know, put on the show and like, this is what we want you to see, um, but never really talk about the process. And I, and and if, if anything that's coming out of all this that's happening is process, not programs is what like, you know, as artists, I think it's gonna be, it's gonna have to be our focus. Um, Cause as artists, we can program all day, but can we, can we adhere to a process that is, um, larger than what our, than, than our work itself, you know? Um, and for me, that's my commitment. It's like, okay, let, let's, let's develop a value system that we're gonna work around and, and then get going. Um, rather than like, here's my, you know, my painting, my print, my object, um, because that comes and goes. And I think the, the lasting legacy, I think in that with Monument, right, is somebody wants a lasting legacy. The lasting legacy, I think for, for some of this work is that um, we have a world where everybody's can be their whole selves and that's it. 
That's great. Good. Well, on that note, um, I will just thank everybody again for being here and for really, really thoughtful questions and just for being really engaged in the conversation. Um, huge thanks to Hoel for sharing your experience and your process and your knowledge with us. I know I every time I talk to you, I feel like I learned something. So thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, and yeah, so thank you everybody for your time, Art and Residence and Moa and everyone who's made this conversation possible. Um, and I think that's it from us. Yeah, have a good Saturday, so, folks. Have a good well, Saturday, thank you everybody. Guys. Appreciate it. Take care. All right. Bye.